Bernard Ferreira. Welcome to Nobel Week in Stockholm. Okay, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, all Nobel laureates are asked to bring a thing, an artifact, to donate to the Nobel Museum here in Stockholm. What did you bring? I bring wooden shoes and I bring a, a car. Could you show yeah. the? Could you show it for us? So and these these are wooden shoes. These are tiny, small wooden shoes. That the kind of wooden shoes I was wearing when I was a boy. I grew up on a farm, and we were wearing these wooden shoes. Did you actually wear these shoes? Not this particular one, but exactly this kind of wooden shoes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. For. And all day, all year yeah, round? No, oh yeah, except when we went to school, because then we had, uh, and when we went to school and church, because then we had shoes, normal shoes, but the wooden shoes we had all the time on the farm, yes, outside. And why did you bring the... Yeah, the that's a very good question, and that goes back to a very fundamental problem of molecules, the molecular world I'm working in, and you might not realize, but the essential molecules in your body, in the cells, like the proteins, the amino acids, the DNA, the sugars, they are all one-handedness, one chirality, left-handed or right-handed. And this unique symmetry problem, prop, uh, property is essential for, for life. And in order for us, at the end, to build a nanomotor, a rotary motor, you have to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise. If it has equal probability going forward or backward, you won't have a motor and it doesn't go anywhere. So the fundamental problem was how to control left over right. Now, coming back to the wooden shoes. When I was a small boy, you all know people make mistakes about left and right. When you go in the wrong shoe, you can easily make that mistake. But when, as a small boy, you make the mistake once to go with your foot in the wrong yeah? with your right foot in the left wooden shoe, it hurts so much yeah. that you never make that mistake during the rest of your life and you know for the rest of your life the distinction between left and right. So that was the beginning of your that scientific was, career? That was more or less the beginning of the adventure and I donate this to the Nobel Museum because it all comes down to distinguishing left and right and then you can make a nanomotor. A nanomotor, because you brought, uh, you're bringing something else too, a photo. Or yeah, a I bought two other items. One is a photo, because this photo here is a, a photo of a replica of an electric car. And this is the world's first electric car that was ever built by a professor at the University of Groningen, Professor Sibander Strating, in 1835. 1835, he gave a demonstration with this electric car in the old medieval place, city of Groningen, to demonstrate that with electricity you could drive a car. And I donate this replica to the museum. It will arrive tomorrow or the day after. Oh, you are donating the whole replica to yes. the museum? Yes, yes. It's about this size and I donate it to the museum because it took 170 or so years before we could make a nano scale, yeah, molecular motor, a rotary motor. And I also brought that and I also donated and it's here. This is the nano motor. Could, could I uh, just ask you if it's, that, that's in the yeah. bottle there, is it the same? No, no this is the car and that has four, it's a four wheel drive. So it has four of these motors attached ah. to a frame and that made it possible that later we could build this nano car. Okay. So here are the motors, this powder, and in contrast to this, this car and this motor, these are one billion times one billion identical motors in here. Incredible. One billion times one billion identical motors, because they are molecular motors, and they are only one nanometer in size, and one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. How, if you compare that with a, a piece of uh, a hair? Yeah, how? so the, 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 if you take your hair, one hair, and you take the cross section, you have 80,000 nanometers. So we could easily fit 80,000 cars next to each other in a line on the cross section. But those motors doesn't look very active. No, because they are in the solid state here. Yeah, it's a powder. But when we bring them in solution, yeah, and then you... you put them in the light, they will start spinning. And so what we did is we built these motors and normally what we do is we have a solution, we dissolve them 
like for instance in water or in other solvent, then we put a lamp and we can measure that they rotate. But in meanwhile, we also have put them on surfaces so that you have a kind of a propeller, like a windmill. So we built a nano windmill park and all these one nanometer windmills all turn in one direction. And then later on we built a four-wheel drive using four of these motors. Why do you build all these uh, things with yeah. electrical motors? Yes, not because we wanted to build a car, but we wanted to show that you could move something, a single molecule over a surface at the nanoscale. So could we really prove that when you have a rotary motor that you can move it forward? How is it moved forward? What's the fuel? Yeah, the fuel of this motor is light and uh, so it's a photochemically driven. The energy comes from the light. Eh? Like in your car, you need a fuel. Absolutely. There's no fuel, no motion. So the fuel is from the light. So when you put a lamp, you can move it. And in the, 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 uh, the car, we use the tip of a scanning probe microscope to excite it. And this is a, a new types of microscopes that have been awarded with the Nobel Laureate couple, Nobel uh, Prize several years ago. And you can then see actually single molecules and single atoms and you can excite those molecules. And this is how we then can move a single car over the surface. And how do you, ha how do you see the, the use of this uh, invention, this uh, yeah, finding? Yeah, it's a very uh, important question. Of course, we work on very fundamental problems here. Like, uh, as I said to you before, moving something at the molecular scale. Now, imagine in your body, in your cells, it's full of motors. Eh? The fact that you can move your arm, your muscles, there are millions of these nanomotors, these biological motors. The fact that your cells can divide. The fact that you and me can look at each other and can see each other. There are these tiny switches and motors that make it possible. And so transport in the body. Uh, the energy production in your body, the ATPase. So there are huge number of, of motors, the machinery that makes your living organism uh, working. But we as chemists, we as scientists hardly know how to make things moving. We are extremely good in making a piece of plastic or a drug or a dye yeah? material, yeah. but you never see it moving no. unless you move it yourself. So the fact that we get into the, in, we have now the possibility through to this work and my colleagues and many others, that we can move things at the molecular scale, induce movement. It's like a small kid making her first steps. Yeah. And so then somebody, many years later, runs the 100 meters within 10 seconds. Not me, eh? but somebody can do it. So it's, it's, it's the start of a new era in chemistry. It's a totally new uh, field, yeah. totally yeah. new era yeah. in chemistry. So you, you ask about potential applications, you have to think then, once you can move things, you have to think about tiny capsules that can open and close and deliver something like a drug. Or you think about materials that repair themselves. So you have a scratch in your car, light enters, it repairs itself. Do you think this can be used in transporting bigger things too? The way of thinking or yeah. the chemistry behind or using the light? That yeah, of course you can think about storage of energy eh? in this nano. Of course one of these motors or one of these tiny uh, uh, things that can move cannot store much energy. But when you have billions and billions of them, you can maybe store energy and, and, and use it. You can make smart surfaces. And eh? Think of my windmills. You make this layer with windmills and you can change the surface properties and the surface adapts yeah, to this different environment. Just like your body can adapt, yeah. you know? Yeah. A scratch can repair itself. And when you see something with your eyes, your body reacts. Eh? It moves your arm or your muscles. And this is the kind of functions that you will see in the future. So smart materials, smart drugs. Yeah. yeah. So what does it feel like being one of the inventors of this new, totally new chemical field? Yeah, it is, it is fantastic. It was an adventure in the last 30, 40 years, of course, and eh, during my whole career. And uh, sometimes you, uh, you have to work extremely hard to make these discoveries, but sometimes you stumble on something and you find something uh, which suddenly you realize, wow, this can be a molecular motor. What was it that in your case that you stumbled on something? Yeah, we, we were working on switches, yeah, to switch between zero and ones to do information storage. And then suddenly we realized that one of these switches was behaving a little bit strange. And when we figured out what was going on, we realized that we had half the turn 
of a rotary motion. Mm -hmm. And when you have half a turn, you can make a full turn. And this is how we developed it. And that's where the left this, and right, right this comes is, in. And we had to make it rotating only left with clockwise or only right, sorry, only right clockwise or only left counterclockwise. And that was the fundamental uh, breakthrough for us. And then from there on, you know, we, we went to, to many other things and so. And, well, uh, you, you, when you tell me it sounds very easy, it's either clockwise or, or counterclockwise, oh, yeah. and you had to yeah. figure out yeah. how, but yeah. how much work was it to yeah, the, the, get there? The initial design was, uh, was pretty difficult because you had to make either this form or this form exclusively, and we knew how to do that, but then you have to move it. And to induce this motion, yeah, we didn't initially not know how to do that, but when we succeeded and we knew how to do that, yeah, then you, you can think, you can dream of windmills and of yeah. cars and all kinds of... How other. long time did it take for you to find the right solution to get the to movement? The right solution from the switching to the rotary motion, that was about 10 years. And then going to the windmills on the surface, nano windmill. It was another seven, six years, I think, yeah? And then to the nano car, where we could really show that it moves forward, it was uh, in total, from the start of the motor, it was uh, 10 years, yes. It took seven years to develop this nano car, yeah? Because I announced it in the Netherlands when I got the Spinoza Award, which is an award in the Netherlands, and the Minister of Science and Education asked me, what are you going to do with this money? And then I discussed this with my students and we had this idea to build a nano car because then we, not because we wanted to build a car, but we could then prove that you could rotary motion convert it into translational motion and forward motion. That was the basic scientific invention. But it took us seven years because building a car was not easy no. and we failed a couple of times and we had to make new models and the synthesis, all yeah. the construction of the molecules. But you succeeded several times, at least three times in this yeah, period. Yeah, and yeah. I guess you've been celebrating a lot at the laboratory oh, with oh, your we students. We have a lot of fun. We have, science has is, is, is exciting. And when you walk into unknown territories, there is no way and nobody to guide you often. So you get lost. But sometimes you get to these moments where you really worked hard after several years with your students and you have this Eureka moment. And I had this fantastic Eureka moment five years after we developed the motor, the first motor. We, the students asked me, come to the lab, because they had done just the experiments where they saw an object moving. And what did a you lot. Yeah. And this was at the moment, I was extremely silent when I got the call from Stockholm. I, did, I was so in the shock, or so uh, I you didn't mean, know what- You mean from the Nobel? Nobel, yes, in October. But then I didn't know what to say. But there was one moment that I recall in 2004, I think it was, that I was also in a shock and I didn't know what to say. And that was the first time that my students asked me into the lab and said, look, we will do the experiment again. And I saw an object moving, rotating, spinning, clockwise only, clockwise rotating. And I couldn't say anything for five minutes. Did your heart beat? Yes, my heart was beating. And I, I was looking at some object with a naked eye and our motor that I didn't see because it was nano. But I saw a micro object spinning clockwise. And when you, after five minutes, was able to speak again, what did you say? I, I, I was, I was, we were yelling and we were so yeah. excited, you know, and we, yes, we made it, we did it, we demonstrated that it was uh, moving. And then when we had the nano car and we saw a single car, single molecule moving, actually. Could, could you show, yeah. could you show on this one? The, yeah. This is, uh, this is yeah. the nano car. Yeah. So this is a copper surface and this is the nano car. So this is the frame. These are the four wheels and they have to rotate, yeah, so that it goes forward. And, and so... Uh, of course, you can, we can design these molecules, but then we have to figure out how to move it over a surface. And that was, took us a lot of measurements and a lot of time. But in the end, we could actually see it, and I will show it during my Nobel lecture, how it moves actually when we excite it. And that was also a very special moment in my life. Of course. So that we can see really movement. And this is actually the, the message of all this work, that you can induce autonomous movement. Eh? You put in energy and things move. And then there are many, many opportunities. Of course, it's very early days. It looks a bit like science fiction. 
But what, 30, 40 years from now, you will have many applications. Have you ever had problems in funding your research since you you are opening kind of a, looking yeah. into a new field and you cannot say what it's going to be used no. for in, in, in yeah. the future? No, this is an extremely important point because funding for fundamental research is often under pressure because with all due respect, politicians and government likes to see often, and also industry, more solutions, eh, short-term solutions. But realize that the fact that we have a smartphone these days, we cannot live without a smartphone anymore, or hardly believe that they were not there. Ten years ago, they were not there. Yeah. The materials to make them, to make the displays and so, were invented in the 50s. Yeah. and date back to the 19th century. So realize it might take 50 years, but if you ever want to have new smartphones, yeah, quote, or something like that, new drugs, new technology for the future, for our make industry, we have to do inventions, breakthroughs. They are completely different. We don't know exactly how to do it. And if you don't invest in fundamental science and we don't train our young students at the universities and at the schools, to work at the frontiers where the new things will be invented. They are going to make, they are going to make our society in 30 years from now. But if we don't confront them now with the best technologies and the challenges, then it will be difficult to maintain our well-being in our society. Yeah. So we need to invest in fundamental science. Of course, there should be a good balance with application and whatever. But in my community, the chemical community, as far as I know, Everybody who sees some possibility for application, if I develop a new catalyst for the chemical process, I talk with my colleagues from industry and they will adapt it and they will bring it to industry because it needs maybe 10 years of development work. So yes, invest in fundamental research. Make, and now I'm a little bit worried because in some countries, including Holland, you know, and I hear in Sweden also, that there is some worries about sufficient investment in basic science which will give us these opportunities for 20, 30 years from now. So that's an important message. I think you ca I cannot emphasize that enough, mm. how important it is. Yeah? Yeah. Believe yeah. in the future and believe in your young people that will make those inventions yeah. and invest in them. Yeah. And coming back to yourself, uh, what brought you to science? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, uh, uh, very nice question. I grew up on a farm and I showed you already the wooden yeah. shoes that I was wearing when I was on the farm. And I, when I was a kid, I think I wanted to become a farmer. Because I, and, and I grew up with my parents and especially my father. We had always discussions about how is it possible that from such a tiny seed, a beautiful plant grows and, and about all the phenomena around you and so. So I was always very eager to learn and to try to, to understand. And this was, uh, I think, very much stimulated in high school. I had an excellent chemistry teacher, a physics teacher. And so it was stimulated a lot. And I was typically a natural science boy, I think, chemistry, physics, mathematics. And then I went to the university and I studied chemistries because uh, I thought all these formulae in mathematics, although uh, I could do that, I liked to see something and to, to, to feel and to, to smell and to see these beautiful colors of chemical materials and crystals and so. But you don't see and, so much in chemistry. I mean, you need microscopes. Yeah, and... But you can, see, you can see something, you can see yeah. materials. And, and, and so, and what got me really off is when I was a student in my third year or so, when I made, I could make my own molecules. Molecules that never existed before. And I remember my professor who was an American, Professor Winberg, he said to me, I think you made a molecule that nobody else in the world has ever made. What molecule was that? That was a, a biaerial compound, you know. It had also to do with left and right-handed molecules. So actually already middle, a little bit at the basis of this. And it was, it gave me such a kick that you could make something like an artist, a piece of music or a painting that nobody had made before. And that nobody in the world apparently had made before. And so I became a synthetic chemist, building molecules, making new molecules, designing my own molecular world. And this is what I did so far. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Have you always been in the academic world? No. I, I did my PhD at the University of Groningen. And then I worked uh, six and a half years at Shell, the oil company, in, in petrochemicals and catalysis, mainly industrial catalysis. 
and in, uh, in, in biochemistry because I was also in the Shell Biosciences Lab in the UK. But then I decided to go back to university. And the main reason was that I wanted to do inventions of myself, to work on, say, really new things that nobody had thought about and to work with students. I love to work with students and I love also teaching. So I like the university atmosphere, the academic environment, to build my own research programs and to work with students yeah, and, and build, to teach them. Yes. Yeah, and build your own uh, research team. And build my own research team, which I did over the years, and, and uh, people from uh, all over the world. I mean, now that I think this summer, I think there were people from 14 different countries coming from China to America, and it, it's really wonderful. It's a great privilege. I consider it a great privilege to work every day with the bright young girls and boys of our country or of this world because they come from all yeah. over the world. Is that important that they come from different cultures and yeah. backgrounds? And... It is fantastic. You Why? Should, you bring, they bring all these different ideas and perspectives and all these young people are excited about, you know, bringing, uh, th about thinking, hey, what could be possible? What could we do in the future? And uh, it's great to be a mentor of such a team and to work with them uh, intensely every day. And as I said before, sometimes we stumble on, on crazy things we have never thought of. But also, the, the, it's also the, the social effect eh? that you bring people from different backgrounds together and you work together uh, every day. Uh, we have emotional moments when things fail, but also when we have these beautiful moments that I was talking before, and then we go to the pub and have a nice drink. Yeah. So we enjoy. Is there anything that you do on the lab that is kind of annoying for your team or that they laugh about you? Maybe when I am in the lab trying to do an experiment myself, because I don't do that anymore. I did that, of course, in, in, the, in the past, but now they say, let us do the experiments because <laughs> it's more <laughs> safe <laughs> and at least it will be possible. So you wouldn't succeed in, in your uh, achievements without your team? Of course, I mean, we work as a team and I have people from with gamest and I have people from the bio area and people from physics backgrounds and we come together. And of course, we cooperate with a lot of other people as well because we don't have all the techniques in our laboratory, so we have to cooperate with people uh, around the world. And that is great. And that's the beauty of, of, of science, that you can go to China or America or whatever country and, and you can talk because your language is the language of science. Our language is the language of chemistry, mm. the molecules. Mm. Yeah? And when I draw a molecule in China or I draw a molecule in Argentina, it's the same molecule. And the people in my field understand immediately without even yes. knowing Spanish or Chinese. And that is beautiful. Yeah. And we, we, of course, our common goal is, it's not about power or about borders of countries or whatever. It's, it's about bringing forward the human knowledge. Mm. That's what we are trying yeah. to do yeah. and stimulate the young people. And, and uh, coming back to the, the Nobel Prize uh, that you have been rewarded this year, what is needed to get so far as achieving the, being awarded the no Nobel Prize? Yeah, that's difficult to say how, how you, you get think? this far. I, I, th I think trying to do things that people have not tried before be a bit different and daring. I would say to the young people, try something, yeah, be a lit, little bit original and creative. Don't follow all the common pathways. Work also hard because it's a lot of hard work over many years. Be persistent and then you might get somewhere. We just discovered something that we have been working on for 20 years and we just did it three years ago. Have you ever had moments when you thought that you just give it up, do something else? I never had moments where I thought I give it up, but sometimes yeah, the frustrations can be high, of course, when you, you work for a couple of years and it doesn't work out because we simply are not smart enough. Nature is so smart. <laughs> Yeah. That, that, that they had solutions that we, uh, we didn't find. Yeah. And so you, you, your design might be wrong. Uh, or you have to find a new way to circumvent some of the problems. Inventing new chemistry, inventing new science. That is what we had to do quite a few times. 
Yeah, and of course you have to fight for grants to get money because research, experimental research like we do it is very expensive and to maintain a large group in a big laboratory for 30 years takes a lot of effort to get the money and so and then you have nice publications and sometimes the referees don't like it and say go back to the lab and work another six months and so this is all part of the life. This is all part of the life of a chemist. But then the next day you teach and then the first year student asks you a brilliant question that you have never thought of, then you are happy again. Yes, I understand that you need a lot of inspiration to go further to, and, yeah. and I wonder what uh, else in life uh, than science is important for you? Uh, what do you exactly mean? Uh, what and yeah, what else in life? Oh, what else have... in life? Yes. Yeah, what oh, else in life yes, is of important course, for you? My wife Betty always says, uh, being a scientist is a way of living, and I think she is very she has it right. So you are you are a musician, you are a, an artist, or you are a scientist or a writer. This does not you are not a scientist during. Uh, I mean, you cannot say during the weekend I'm not a scientist anymore. So it is a way of living. But uh, yeah, I have I have although I have not enough time. I have also hobbies, you know. And and so as I grew up on a farm, I have a big garden, and I like to grow my own vegetables and to work outside and a bit in the woods or in the garden or whatever. That's also that I do that in the weekends uh, if I have time, just to clear up my mind and to get new ideas. It helps a lot, actually, you know, when you physically do yeah. something. Yeah. And I like sports. I bike every day to the lab, fourteen kilometers one way. So that's a nice exercise. And I skate, I do ice skating. Mm-hmm. So, so I like that a lot. All these uh, things are important for you. Yeah, in your but I have. As a scientist. Yes, and of course I have a family. We have three daughters. Uh, we enjoy hiking and we have uh, our family life, and so, which is, means a lot to me. And I'm uh, from a large family. So I have nine brothers and sisters, and my wife wow. was also from a family of nine. So we have a, a huge family, and I en- en- enjoy very much that we have a very tight family, and we come together, and so and we have friends. This is for me very important. Yeah. But I would like to have more time for these things. But you cannot do everything, you know. I like history a lot, but not enough time to read. <laughs> right. But it's uh, but it's it's really uh, wonderful. Yes. Yeah. But if there is, uh, if there's really ice outside when it's freezing, then uh, in the afternoon you won't find me in the lab. I'm out skating. Really? That's what. Yeah. I'm... So lucky there is not ice all the winter in in the no, Netherlands. That would then. not be good for my <laughs> science because then I would be out of the lab too often. Okay. Thank you so much for the interview. It's been a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.